Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this fifth and final lecture of our series on cavity optomechanics. This lecture promises to be very interesting today as we hear about multimode optomechanics and uh, topological systems. So we're very much looking forward to that. Before we get started, let me also quickly take this opportunity to advertise what's coming next. Um, on the 2nd of February, we have our next blog. Um, here you can see the poster for this. Sorry if there's... Um, okay, hope no, you can see it now. So this will be on topological optomechanics. So this lecture will also be a sort of introduction to the topic. And we have two speakers that day. Um, Amir Yosefi, he was a PhD student in, uh, at the APFL in Lausanne. And he will be talking about an exciting um, new uh, system they have for building large optomechanical lattices and exploring topological physics. And then Ewald Verhagen from AMOF uh, will talk about realizing emission and non-emission topological systems in um, nano-optomechanical networks. So if you're interested, um, do come along on the 2nd of February as well for, for these two exciting talks. And with this, let me now hand over to uh, Vittorio. We're very much looking forward to your lecture. Uh, thank you very much. So I share the screen. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> First of all, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, we, we discussed until now mostly single mode optomechanics and just a few examples um, like this, uh, like microwave to phot photon translation, which had three modes. So, a very simple example of multimode optomechanics. Uh, and uh, I think the catch, I think the, the thing why Automechanic is really so powerful and so interesting is that we have a nonlinear inter interaction that in principle is very small. Uh, at, if look at the level of single photons, uh, but uh, since it's nonlinear, basically you can uh, um, uh, shine a laser on, on, uh, on the system and uh, you can have many photons in your system and this gives you a knob to tune uh, the interaction. So not only you can enhance it and you, and you have a, a strong um, linear interaction, but you can also uh, tune it. Uh, we have seen it until now mostly uh, what we have exploited is to the laser frequency. So if you drive it, if you drive the interaction, for instance, on the, on the um, red side band, you tend to um, transduce and uh, this allows, for instance, transfer excitation from the mechanics to the optics and vice versa. If we drive on the on the blue side band, uh, uh, we can have cell sustain oscillation. If we drive in uh, uh, close to the resonance, we have good uh, uh, sensing. And then now the idea is that, uh, uh, so this already gives a lot of freedom, but uh, we, we, we can have much more freedom if we start to combine many many different optomechanical modes. And these modes are, uh, so in, in actually many modes are naturally there if you have a cavity and if you have a mechanical uh, oscillator. So this is, um, uh, this is the setting that, that you can think. So any, any mechanical system has many modes, any cavity has many uh, optical modes. And so uh, there are many a world where you exploit uh, these uh, like intrinsic richness of your system. But another thing that you can think that you could think you could do is like to have some uh, spatial arrangement of, of different modes. Uh, and so this is more the thing where I'm more interested uh, into today. Uh, and then yeah, the idea is that we basically we will have a system where photon and phonons can open a lattice. And uh, what is really interesting, I can have a tunable interaction between these photon and phonon modes. So this is what is the big idea. Um, okay, uh, I want to mention, so historically the first implementation of a small array uh, uh, was uh, in this experiment from Lipson group. Uh, and um, 
Um, so here it's something very natural. You put uh, uh, close to each other uh, um, some toroid uh, structure that uh, has some whispering gallery. Each toroid has a whispering gallery mode that uh, is uh, um, uh, that is coupled to some breathing mode. Uh, then they will be naturally uh, coupled via the evanescent light and this device has, uh, has been used uh, to study synchronization. We will talk about this later. Uh, then another approach that uh, uh, I like very much uh, and that uh, uh, it's very um, uh, very good to, to have many modes uh, that are spatially separated uh, is this one about uh, based on optomechanical crystals. So I, I think I mentioned this a few times, but I never explain this in much detail so i want to explain it a little bit uh, more right now so here the idea is that you start from a periodic structure and uh, every periodic structure uh, will have a band structure both for the uh, so we uh, maybe i should explain better so this is basically a pattern uh, silicon freestanding silicon slab typically uh, and so it's periodic because the pattern is, is periodic and then uh, typically what you have, since you have this crit translational invariance, uh, you have a, a band structure. So the, the, the conserved quantity is the, is the quasi-momentum and I can plot the energy function of, of the quasi-momentum. Uh, and um, so this structure has been, this particular structure with these snowflakes as something that is special. And it's uh, here I, I display the optical band structure and the mechanical band structure. As you can see, both have, uh, quite a big uh, band gap. Um, and uh, the reason for this is, um, uh, uh, well, that it's, uh, so let's say the, there are two main features that you, uh, that you can immediately identify by looking at this structure. So the first thing uh, is that it's very symmetric. You see it has this nice C6 symmetry uh, by, for rotation by, by six degrees on top of some mirror symmetry. And the second uh, feature is that uh, you can, uh, you see, you can think it of like triangular membrane that are connected by, by a weak link. Uh, and um, these uh, uh, so allow to explain uh, why there is this nice mechanical uh, band gap. So the idea is that, uh, so this is by the way, only for the in-play modes, the, this band structure. And the idea is that, uh, Imagine that you would make this uh, link uh, like smaller and smaller, then the, your system will tend to become floppy. And then there are two types of modes. So the, the modes that describe the relative motion of the triangles, and this will go at uh, lower and lower frequency, whereas there will be modes that describe the internal motion of the triangles, and these uh, remain always more or less at the same frequency, and this creates this big band gap. And the nice thing is that we have also a per, like a complete band gap for the optical excitation. And yet it's also important that you have such a symmetric uh, structure, such that in all the direction, the light, see uh, the, the band gap at the similar frequency. Okay. And then uh, this is the starting uh, point to, to create a very good optomechanical system. Uh, the second uh, point is to uh, start to modify this structure and create some defect. And basically, uh, I will not explain this in detail, but what this defect uh, uh, does, so it's very smooth. And so I can really think of it as like uh, modifying this initial state of the band structure. And what it does basically it lift one of the state into the band gap. Uh, and then uh, I have a state that is very well isolated with the environment because it doesn't have any um, any state inside of the slab uh, it can talk to. So for the um, mechanics, I will still have some decay because of uh, nonlinear interaction. And uh, for the optics, the main um, uh, the main uh, mechanism leading to the case that the photon can leak out from the to the top in to the free space so in the vertical direction because of course quasi the, the, the trans no, there is no transition variance in the in the vertical direction and so you see this is very nice if you want to uh, build a system where you can, you want to uh, uh, like uh, use it as a building block and have many modes on on uh, 
on a lot. So this is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this is a part of the proposal I will talk about later. Uh, yeah, we wanted to have uh, a uh, basically a Kagomi lattice of, of, of co-localized optical and mechanical modes. And then yeah, the idea would be, uh, at least our vision was that one could uh, drive it uh, from the top of the laser field and address all the, all the optical uh, modes at the same time. Uh, Okay, so uh, by the way, so this was the first paper that uh, talked about uh, this concept of optomechanical arrays. Uh, and uh, um, at least with this type of model, uh, where, um, and so here the idea is, is what I mentioned already before. So I have in, in every lattice site, I have an, a mechanical mode and an optical mode. Uh, and I have uh, the the mechanical interaction is only on site because only the mode that are co-localized will have a strong optomechanical coupling uh, and then um, i'm driving all the sides possibly with different phases uh, and uh, uh, i have that photon can up from uh, to nipple inside but also mechanical vibration can can optimize on site and uh, so the what this would allow is to, uh, or allows, uh, is the, um, so to have a system where I have the support both photons and phonons that can propagate, and I have a light tunable interaction between the photon and the phonons. And conceptually, you could, if you use this optomechanical crystal, so it's very simple setting. So you really can think of working with just a single material, and then you engineer the property uh, by engineering the pattern of walls, and you, in principle, could drive it even with a single uh, laser. Okay, and uh, especially on the theory side, there are a lot of uh, uh, work in this direction, and um, um, in many different topics. And uh, what I will focus here uh, in this presentation is uh, synchronization and uh, uh, the engineering of topological uh, uh, states uh, or topological bed structures. Okay, uh, maybe I, I start with synchronization. Um, um, so this is uh, what we discussed yesterday. So if I have a single optomechanical cell and I drive it uh, on the blue side band, um, I, uh, I have this, uh, there is this process uh, uh, where I create uh, a pair of photon and uh, phonons into the cavity that is resonant. And what typically happens, uh, the, the optical cavity has a much larger decay rate. So the, the, the photon uh, very quickly leaks out, but the phonon start to accumulate. Um, and then uh, I am what is a so-called op uh, bifurcation that occurs when Basically, the, the optically induced anti damping perfectly cancel the, the intrinsic damping that any mechanical oscillator would have. Uh, and uh, in, uh, when, I, when I reach this, uh, this, um, this, the, this regime, uh, the, the mechanical system will start to self oscillate uh, and uh, we reach, uh, a st and then uh, at some point uh, at the beginning, the the, the, the oscillation amplitude increase exponentially, but at some point the antinominality will set in and I uh, typically have a limit cycle uh, where the amplitude is fixed, uh, but I have a free uh, phase. And then the question is, uh, this is what I described is what would happen in a single optomechanical cell? What happens when I uh, start to couple many, um, many mechanical cells? Uh, many optomechanical cells, uh, what is the collective dynamics. And uh, the, uh, uh, so the phenomenon that uh, uh, it's more interesting if you consider cell sustained oscillator is uh, phase locking. So uh, synchronization that they start to auto oscillate with the same phase. So this is, uh, as is a, 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 uh, yeah, a phenomenon that has a long history. So it has been uh, first observed by uh, uh, Huygens uh, with uh, two pendulum clock. Uh, and um, so he, basically what he observed is that 
if you have two pendula that even if they have a uh, uh, slightly different uh, intrinsic uh, uh, frequency at which uh, different frequency at which they self oscillate if you start to couple them so for instance in this case the, the two pen this is the, by the way the original drawing by Owens in this case the two uh, uh, self sustained uh, oscillating pendula are, are uh, hanging from the same support and so they are coupled by the vibration that are transmitted in, in, the, in the support and so I, if the if the um, if the is the if the frequency oscillating frequency of this uh, pendula are slightly different, they uh, when once they become coupled, they will start to uh, uh, oscillate and exactly at, at the same frequency, so they become uh, synchronized. And this is important uh, in many uh, uh, situation: physics, chemistry, biology, uh, and so on. Um, so what is the simplest way to, to describe this phenomenon? Uh, well, um, basically, we, uh, as I discussed, uh, we, uh, we want to describe a, an oscillator uh, that is, is, is oscillating at, at, at the constant frequency, uh, um, which is fixed. And so this would be this uh, very simple linear differential equation for the phase. Uh, and then how do we um, uh, uh, introduce uh, synchronization? So the idea is that we uh, need to, to introduce an attractive force between the two phases. And the simplest way to do it is to add this uh, uh, sign term. This is the famous Kuramoto model. It's clear that you need the, the signs because, uh, so first of all, you, you need um, something which is periodic in the phase. Uh, and so a sinus is good. And then if you want to have something attractive uh, and linear for small phase difference, uh, uh, the sinus is the right thing, right? And it captures the, 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 essential, uh, the essential feature of, of uh, uh, synchronization. And uh, in a realistic system, there might be some additional term, but uh, this is often the, um, the, what you get in some limited, limiting cases. Okay, so this um, model is known as Kuramoto model. And this is a review about the Kuramoto model. Um, okay. Um, and so this is the dynamic that I, that I get. If I uh, uh, basically uh, plot the difference of, of the phases uh, as a function of the coupling strengths, uh, and um, so the idea is that, uh, so if the coupling, there is really a transition, if the coupling is uh, small, uh, it will be, I would have something that it uh, time dependent, so it's not plotted here, uh, but uh, above a critical threshold for the coupling, uh, which depends on the difference between the two phases, I start to have phase locking. So the, uh, I will get uh, a, fixed phase difference that uh, is progressively reduced as I uh, increase the coupling. And um, so another way to describe this, so now I uh, plot the observed frequency difference and without coupling as a function of the bare frequency difference. Uh, so without coupling, of course, it's just uh, a line. Uh, but if I add the coupling, there is a, uh, um, a finite uh, range of frequency difference uh, where uh, um, the um, where the, the frequency uh, uh, difference becomes zero, and it's so you see it's really a phase transition. Um, and how to understand this? Well, in this uh, Kuramoto model, it's it's very simple. Um, you uh, so it's like the overdamped uh, dynamic of uh, of the particle, and you can uh, um, basically uh, say, uh, okay, this is my force, what would be the potential? Uh, and so you just have to integrate this term and you get this uh, uh, wash, washboard uh, potential, uh, which you see as uh, this shape. So if delta omega is very large, it doesn't have any minimum. And so it will just 
uh, describe a particle that it's rolling down the ear, uh, whereas if uh, below a critical value of the, the tuning, I start to have these uh, different minima, and these are the, the scales of synchronized phase. Okay. Um, so for auto mechanics, uh, uh, um, so uh, this has been this for and just for two cells, this has been uh, described in this very interesting paper. Um, and uh, you see that here um, uh, there are two uh, different synchronized phase, uh, zero and pi, and there is some unsynchronized region. And this is related to the fact that we have something uh, more complicated than just a simple chromoto model. Um, so um, these are um, like two papers that have uh, studied uh, this phenomenon. So for uh, from the Lipson group and one tongue group. Um, so the, the, these are the earlier paper that have, have investigated um, synchronization in optimal mechanical array. And you arrived to this first, okay, this was not even an array, it was just, uh, yeah, it's just a two, uh, so it's very small array of just, with just two sites. And here we have seven sites array. And so this is the, the first work that I started at the beginning. Um, and they see that uh, uh, the pendula can synchronize and this, uh, uh, can decrease the phase noise. So it was, um, yeah, this is like uh, uh, the, one of the reasons why uh, synchronization is so prominent is that uh, when the oscillator synchronizes, then the phase becomes more, more robust. And so it's something that could be useful in a clock. Um, okay, on the, on the theory side, uh, um, basically, um, uh, yeah, I go back to this paper from Irish. Uh, and um, uh, so here it's, uh, I, it's the sky what happens in a, a little bit more realistic setting. Uh, and um, so if I, uh, this would be also what I can, the so-called off equation in the off equation. And so they describe well what happens also in an optomechanical system goes to the criticality. And uh, in this, this equation is slightly more complicated than the Kuramoto model. Uh, they are equation not only for the phase, but also for the amplitude. Uh, and uh, the amplitude uh, basically is, is just a term that uh, basically push it back to the stationary amplitude. So it, 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 if you start slightly away from the stationary amplitude, it will decay on, on the stationary amplitude. And this is a very fast motion compared to the motion of the phase, and so uh, often can be eliminated and you arrive to an equation like the Kuramoto model. Um, okay, and, uh, but if you uh, describe, uh, uh, try to derive starting from uh, uh, the, 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 the real equation for the amplitude and the phase, an equation for the phase in the special case of an optical system, you will find a more complicated model compared to the Kuramoto model with some additional term. Uh, and, uh, and so this has been studied, uh, investigated uh, numerically uh, also by Florian Marco group. Uh, and um, uh, besides synchron, so, and so this is to say that uh, the synchronization is not the end of the story. You can have like very complicated patterns uh, and uh, yeah, they identify a, a lot of different uh, phases, out of equilibrium phases where you have, for instance, spirals, uh, uh, vortices, uh, mobile spirals, pulsating spirals. So the physics is really very rich. Um, Vittorio, a quick question. Yeah. So how would I interpret these patterns? So what do I see there? Um, so uh, basically this, um, um, so what do you mean? Can you explain that? Like the, the, the patterns for the, I, I suppose the color scale refers to the- Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. Uh, the color space is the phase, yes, right. And uh, these are just snapshots, but for instance, when there is pulsating spirals, uh, it means that uh, actually there's going to be some time dependence going on. 
Um, so to be honest, I also do not remember all the details of this work. Uh, it was a work of a PhD student from Florian, uh, but he really made, uh, so this is all numerical, and uh, he uh, made very extensive uh, uh, numerical uh, simulation, and then, um, uh, and somehow he like identified this border by looking at data along the border, and I don't know how automated was the the uh, the work of identifying the different phases. So I think it was mostly done really by hand. So um, and uh, yeah. so it, this is also just for is this for a, an array or for two oscillators that synchronize? No, this is for a big array. So here every pixel is uh, a, an oscillator basically. Ah, okay. and, and it's also not uh, 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 basically it's uh, not simulated with a real auto mechanical equation, but it's uh, uh, basically they're simulating this uh, equation for the phase that they have derived. Okay, wow, well, thank you. Yeah, that was a very interesting work indeed. Uh, and then, yeah, I wanted to <laughs> advertise some own work. Um, so, this is a, a a topic that is very exciting for people who study um, like synchronization also in the Kuramoto model is our so-called chimera states. So uh, yeah, the, this concept uh, basically means, uh, so most of the time, uh, uh, okay, naively you might expect that you, uh, if you have um, a main oscillator and they are all identical, uh that uh you would have just two phases so one where they are uh, unsynchronized and one where they are synchronized and what people have said that actually uh even though if you can uh oh sorry um basically uh even in a situation uh this would not occur if i have different oscillator because the one with the similar phase we synchronize and the other not but what people have observed is that even when they, uh, there are situations where they, the coupling is really quite strong comparing to the, uh, comparing to the um, different inferences. And so you can really consider the oscillator to be identical. There are some uh, uh, basically phases where some of them are synchronized and some not. And this is really a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So it depends on the initial condition. And uh, um, so here we discuss how to observe this in, in an optomechanical system and in, in an optomechanical system that, that would be realistic so with very few modes. Uh, and then um, here, uh, this in this case, we, the idea is that we have like different, uh, some oscillator that are different one from the other, but I have, we have two copy of the same system. And each copy is uh, separately uh, driven by uh, a view the tune laser, uh, and uh, and so uh, in principle you would expect that the dynamic of the two uh, uh, system uh, is identical. Okay, you shouldn't you shouldn't because you have you are in a multi-stable situation of course, but uh, at least the Hamiltonian is the same. Uh, and then uh, we uh, basically imagine to couple them uh, mechanically, where well, the mechanical coupling uh, is an all-to-all all coupling that uh, uh, is engineering, engineering with a red tune uh, driving. And here uh, I showed the, the, this um, uh, chimera state dynamics. So the idea is that uh, if I have a very small um, um, uh, a very small coupling. Uh, they are, um, uh, you see, they are both arrays are, syn are synchronized, uh, but uh, they are synchronized at different uh, frequency. Um, basically, the idea is that the underlying what the underlying physics that happens is that depending on the initial condition, they can synchronize at different frequency. There are four discrete frequency, basically, which are the eigenfrequency of uh, basically, it can happen that one oscillator can pull the other to its own frequency, and which one wins depends on the initial condition. And so here we had a situation where uh, the, the two identical array, one ended up self-oscillating 
uh, at a certain frequency and the other at a different frequency. And then at an intermediate level of the coupling, uh, you have that uh, one of the array basically wins over the other and it start to pull uh, to destroy the synchronized state of the of the other array and you have this chimera state uh, where uh, one of the, the arrays synchronized and the other it's uh, not and then if you increase the coupling even more they will be synchronized at the same frequency okay so this is the, was the story for this paper um, and uh, now I want to switch to uh, topic and talk about the project of optomechanics. Um, okay, so yeah. and now, yes. Uh, in the slide before, so um, the intermediate. Uh... Yes. I cannot hear you anymore. Um. It means uh, uh, it means that the four oscillators are synchronized among them, not the two systems, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. So basically, a precondition to have these chimera states in this setting is that when they are not coupled between them, so I have these two different arrays, and at the beginning they are not coupling, coupled, that they synchronize a different eigenfrequency, and this depends on the initial condition. Okay, was this the question? Uh, yes, so if, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, then maybe I switch gear and I want to talk about topological optomechanics. And so, as a first step, I want to explain uh, what the topology is about uh, in this setting. And um, so, what I'm uh, Interesting too is the topology of band structure. And so uh, I want to explain what, what, why, and how can band structure be topological. Uh, so, first of all, <laughs> very general recap what is topology? Uh, so, it's an area of mathematics that uh, it's concerned ab about property that are preserved under continuous de deformation. And so, since they are con uh, preserved under continuous deformation, I can describe them as uh, in terms of integer numbers because uh, integer number, uh, uh, I cannot uh, with a continuous transformation change an integer number into a different integer number. Um, and um, and so the, the, the most, uh, and so an exa example of continuous deformation are stretching and bending, but not tearing and gluing. And here we come to the most famous topological property, which is the genus. Uh, this is a, the topology, well known uh, topological property of oriented surface. So if I uh, have a, a surface in, in uh, a 2D surface in the 3D play, uh, space, uh, uh, I can uh, uh, basically the, it's the, the relevant topological property is the number of walls. So surfaces that have the same number of walls are topologically identical. The, so this is like the most famous example. I can continuously modify a, a cap uh, into uh, torus. Uh, and again, so here we are, uh, we are interested in, in topology of the structure. What is the, the equivalent uh, here? Uh, so the idea is that uh, we are interested in systems that are described by wave equations. And so they could be classical wave, like photon and phonons, or also quantum particles, so matter waves, so like electrons. Uh, and then if I have a system that at least approximately is translational invariance, uh, so a very uh, generic consequence of interference is that the energy level uh, will be divided, in, divided into a, a loud uh, energy region, which we refer to as bands, uh, separated by forbidden region, which we call uh, band gaps. And the idea is that we are, uh, what we are looking for is a solution, uh, are, are, sorry, properties uh, that um, um, property that are invariant, uh, if I uh, change my underlying equation in a continuous way without closing a band gap. 
And so the question is what uh, this quantity might possibly be. Uh, and so let's uh, try to figure it out. So uh, we can consider an infinite system uh, with a gap spectrum. Uh, you see, I assume that I have at least one translational invariant direction and this allow me to plot uh, the, uh, uh, to plot the, the band structure as a function of the momentum in this direction. And uh, since uh, if, it's, if it's really a bulk system, I would have also translational invariant in the y direction. And so, and if the system is infinite, I will have an infinite number of bands, or if you want a continuous band separating the, uh, in a band gap separating the two bands. And then the question is what uh, happen if I add the physical boundary to this system? How can this band structure happen? Well, it could be that there is some state that is localized here I imagine to have just a semi-infinite strip. So I have just one physical boundary, but I still have translational invariance in this direction. Uh, and so what can happen? I, what can happen is that I can have an, an edge state that is localized about the boundary. And so this will appear as uh, an additional uh, state in my band structure. So it, this gray part describes the state, this, the, the bulk state, these are not influenced by the boundary. And on top of it, I have an edge state that it's localized about the boundary. And so maybe I want to remind you that if I have a positive slope, I have a right moving state. So this describes a right moving state uh, in my system. And uh, I could also have something like this, a state uh, going like this. And in this case, it's moving in the opposite direction. Negative slope means that moving. Uh, I could also have something like this, that the velocity changes size. That's also perfectly legit. Uh, but I could not have something like this. So this is really not OK. Uh, and uh, there are uh, several reasons. So one reason, reason is that the band is not uh, a single value. So you will never get something uh, like this if you're diagonalizing an Hamiltonian. And also another thing that it's very unphysical, uh, uh, you see the velocity uh, goes to infinity here yeah? and then to minus infinity. So it's just not possible, right? Okay, uh, then if you keep this in mind, uh, we go, go back to this state. Uh, and if I change my Hamiltonian continuously, how can the state change? Oh, no, sorry, here. Yeah. Uh, okay, no, sorry. This was a repetition in the slide. Yeah, now I want to study two, two material and I anticipate this will be the trivial one and this will be the topological. Uh, so these are really different. So, uh, but uh, if I look at the band structure, I will not be able to see the difference until I add the physical boundary. And if I had the physical boundary, I might have that in both cases I have an edge state. Uh, but uh, the question is, are these edge state robust? Um, and okay, first of all, there are two things. Can I get rid of this edge state? It's really a topological uh, uh, property, this edge state. And the second thing is, can I have a scattering in my system? And from this picture, you see that the two questions are related. So first of all, let's address the question of the best scattering. So if I have this kind of edge state, uh, I have a right mover and a left mover. And then I can, so for the same energy, I have both left mover and right mover, which means that they can best scatter into the, from the right mover into the left mover. So clearly here, best scattering is not forbidden. Whereas if you consider this case, I have only the left mover. And so at that energy, there is no other state moving in a different direction. So I have robust transport. And then uh, the other question, is this robust? It's really a topological property. Uh, where well, it's very easy to see. So in this case, uh, you can really get rid of the, uh, of the with a continuous transformation shown, you can get rid of the edge state. You, you can, you see, you can break this degeneracy. There's no reason to have this degeneracy. And basically you then raise this edge state, which has zero velocity here into the top band and this in the lower band. Um, and so, this is, uh, and so the catch is if I have an equal number of left and right mover, uh, I can, then the state is trivial. 
And whereas let's consider now this situation, this more interesting situation where I had only one left mover. And you see here, I can start uh, to modify these. And um, uh, these are all legit modification, continuous modification of the main structure. Uh, but there is no way I can get rid of it. So the only thing that I can do is the following thing. Here I had only, I'm always focusing at the number of states for a fixed energy inside of the main gap. Main gap. The only, at the beginning, I had just one right mover. And with continuous modification, I can switch to this situation where I have two uh, right mover and one left mover. But you see the, the sum, uh, the net sum, so the number of uh, right mover and of left mover cannot be changed. It's always, in this case, it's always one. And so this is really my topological uh, property. You might think, oh, but I can do this kind of trick and now I have both right mover and left mover, but you come to this pathological situation. So, uh, where uh, the, the band structure is not single value and you have this like a, a speed that goes from plus infinity to minus infinity. So this is not good. So it's really not possible. It's top of, you, you can convince yourself just with geometrical argument that the net number of, of, of uh, movers is really a topological quantity. And then, uh, um, Okay, this is a little bit of a jump and I will not describe the details here, but then the idea is that, uh, okay, I have this, uh, I have proved it. I, if I have this edge state, uh, uh, I cannot get rid of them. And then the question is what happens if I break this translational invariance and I start to make corner and things like this. And then the idea is that since there is no uh, state I can bet scatter into uh, the, um, I, uh, the edge state will continue along the boundary. And so basically any small, uh, uh, so which means that uh, basically the edge state is an intrinsic property. So for any shape of the boundary, I will have the edge state. And so from this, I can conclude that it's actually a property of the bulk, but it's a property of the bulk that I cannot see directly in the band structure. I have to look at the normal modes or the, uh, uh, wave functions to, to be able to see it. And there is a very famous quantity, the churn number, which is a function of the normal modes uh, that uh, is able, I can, it's well defined for any periodic system. And uh, um, uh, based on the churn number, I can predict uh, the net number of edge state. This is the so-called boundary correspondence. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the story. And note that, um, so now I'm um, I'm obviously discussing, maybe I didn't even say it, but uh, I can have this non-trivial share number and like this state moving in just in one direction, or if I break the time reversal symmetry. If I hadn't break the time reversal symmetry, if I have a state moving in one direction, I should have also another state moving in the opposite direction. Uh, and so this a precondition to have this chair number that are different from zero is really to break the time reversal symmetry. Of course, it's just a precondition, it's not a sufficient condition. Um, and um, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I wanted just to mention that uh, uh, already for some time, so already let's say for more than 10 years, uh, there is a lot of activity in uh, topological photonics, uh, whereas uh, um, now what I'm going to discuss, topology and optomechanics is something relatively new. We started, and even in, in, uh, in a phononic system for vibration, it all started in the same period about 2015. Um, Actually, so I have to admit that these are some slides that I copied from some presentation that I gave in 2015. This the next few slides, so I use this part here. And um, uh, okay, the motivation why we want to do this. Uh, so it's a fun game. Uh, uh, we want to make uh, uh, so. Uh, to make photons and phonon mimics uh, the property of topological electrons. Uh, because yeah, this was uh, all this, I also should have mentioned this, all this business of topological administration of, of course, started with the discovery of the quantum all effects. So at the beginning, it was restricted only to uh, electronic system. 
Um, there, of course, it's very easy to break time, the time of SI invariance using a magnetic field. Um, but for photons and phonons, it's much more uh, uh, tricky because they do not have a charge. Uh, and then uh, possible, um, so even, in, and this would, okay, so yeah, the motivation, so it's a fungi, and then the other thing, uh, uh, so even in the classical system, it's, uh, it's, uh, it would be very useful to have unidirectional transport that it's really robust also in the presence of disorder. So I could think uh, of like this funny situation. Yeah, I'm thinking of transport of vibration that I have, uh, that the vibration from one buff to the other goes only uh, in, along the route and from one to the other through a different route. Uh, and then uh, also um, in quantum information processing to have uh, uh, robust, um, um, non-reciprocal elements, and also investigate qualitative new physics that do not have an equivalent in electronic system. So this year it was with a question mark in 2015, <laughs> and this is the status uh, year. So now we have uh, actually, so I have the big claim that we were the first to propose a, an active topological device. Uh, we proposed a topological amplifier in 2016, and then uh, and, uh, another, uh, another thing that had uh, now recently uh, like a big uh, impact are these topological uh, uh, laser. So these are all uh, 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 like situation that you couldn't, like devices that you couldn't implement with, with an electronic system. Um, okay, and then I, um, by the way, how much time do I have just to have an idea? Um, okay, yes. Maybe I will go on for 20 more minutes. Um, okay, so uh, now I wanted to, um, um, I will talk about a proposal that we did uh, already in, in 2015 uh, and uh, how to re-engineer this topological, uh, um, topological edge state in, a, in a using optomechanics uh, and also back in the time reversal symmetry. Uh, so the setting we have in mind is the one that I've already presented before, optomechanical arrays. So I repeat myself here. So conceptually it's very simple. So we just have this dielectric patterns lab, freestanding lab, and we illuminate it with just a single laser. Uh, and basically the goal that we want to have is to have some topological vibrations so that are robust. Uh, that cannot be the scatter. So here you see they are, um, uh, this is really a simulation of the system that we propose. And uh, you see they are uh, kind of uh, disappearing. And the reason is because uh, I do not have the scattering, but I still have dissipation. So the, the, the excitation can decay out of the system. And then the, the, what I would like to have is to have a system where I can uh, excite and read out uh, and create uh, this mechanical vibration all using the, the light. Okay, and, uh, and basically the idea is all I need is uh, this optomechanical array. It's important, kind of important to use some lattice that has a lot of symmetry. Uh, so in this case, this Kagomi lattice. And then the other important ingredient is that uh, uh, the, the driving phase in the different sides is coherent, and I have this pattern of phases in the different point of the lattice. Okay, this I have already discussed before. Uh, okay, so this is, is my Hamiltonian for my optomechanical array, and if I start to shine light on it, um, Okay, uh, basically the idea is that, uh, yeah, so this is my Hamiltonian now, uh, still without interaction. I have photon hopping on a lattice and uh, a phonon hopping on, a on the same lattice with different, of course, with very different resonant frequency and hopping rates. Uh, and um, 
the idea is that so it's a periodic system and I have in this carbon lattice I have three uh, sub lattices and this implies that I will have uh, three bands uh, and also um, basically yeah the shape of the band will be uh, uh, exactly the same only the bandwidth will change and the resonance frequency and this is the very famous Kagomi uh, band uh, uh, band structure and uh, this band structure is well known to support diracons uh, these diracons are also well known from graphene and I have to mention so this is a very generic feature that comes from the symmetries so if you have C6 symmetry and a normal mode that has some rotation, some uh, quasi-angular momentum, you automatically get these Dirac-cons at the high symmetry points. And uh, um, yeah, and so on. And the, the bands are degenerate. So yeah, I don't have, do not have yet any band gap. And then the question is, what happens when I start to illuminate it with a laser? <clears throat> And I can describe now the situation with the usual setting of linear lights, uh, optomechanics. The laser creates a steady light amplitude uh, in each cavity and also a mechanical displacement. Uh, and uh, I go from a very weak nonlinear interaction to a, a strong and tunable linear uh, interaction uh, where so before I, uh, I had a, a single, uh, like, uh, I had, uh, this is the optomechanic coupling for a single, when I have a single photon, and basically this is multiplied by the amplitude of the light in the cavity, and this amplitude comes uh, with a phase that uh, uh, is related to the driving phase. And so this will be the main uh, and most important ingredient. And we, if I do this, I see that indeed I open a band gap, and um, yeah, and again, so this band gap is due to the breaking of the time reversal symmetry that comes from these phases that are imprinted. So I can, the fact that I that I break the time reversal symmetry, I, I can see by the fact that this I cannot get a real Newtonian. So even if I try to make some gauge transformation, it's not possible to get rid of these complex phases. Uh, and uh, now I want to motivate why this will be something uh, topological. And um, 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 so basically, uh, the idea is that uh, what I want, I want to convince you is that uh, actually my photons and phonons will be a very, um, or in particular my phonon, I want to focus on the phonon, will uh, be uh, in the same way, uh, in a similar way, in an analogous way as electron in, in, a, in a magnetic field. So if you have electron in a magnetic field in the tight binding regime, where basically they are, um, uh, the, they are all in the same band and the interaction with the remaining band is negligible just because the, they are very strongly, tightly confined. Uh, what will happen when I switch on a magnetic field is just that uh, when they op uh, from one side to the other, they pick up a phase. And this phase is the integral uh, of the vector potential along the pathway. So this is uh, the way I would describe um, uh, electron and magnetic field. And so here yeah, the idea is that if I manage to engineer also for my uh, bosonic vibration, the same phase, I will have the same dynamics. This is what is uh, normally called a synthetic gauge field. Uh, and uh, uh, now I want to show why I have this complex phase when if I consider phonon, this phonon dynamics. Um, basically, I'm interested in a, uh, in a situation where uh, the um, so I'm not exactly at the uh, red side band, and so I have some detuning between the uh, between the photon and 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 the phonon, uh, and then um, and the idea is that uh, this the tuning uh, what I can have, but the interaction will be still important and can have very strong effects. So and in particular, if I do uh, uh, perturbation theory. Uh, 
so this is the simplest uh, situation that I can analyze, uh, where uh, both the interaction and the optical hopping are, uh, are perturbation compared to, to the detuning between the optics and the mechanics, this omega plus delta. And in this case, uh, basically, um, I have that uh, the optical mode, so the, the interaction are weak, but since the mechanical mode would be uh, all the um, degenerate, if I also do not consider yet the hopping, uh, they can still have a very strong effect. And uh, this is described, and, and basically in um, uh, up to leading order, basically the process that it's important is this one. So I have a virtual, uh, I can virtually, so this is a virtual process, it's higher order in perturbation theory. I can convert a phono into a photon on site because the interaction is on site. And then I hope to a different photon op to a different site uh, optically. And then I'm back uh, converted into a phonon. And you see that if I look at this rate of this process using standard perturbation theory, there is the product of these phases. And so if, I, uh, if these phases are different, uh, I... Um, I will get uh, a, a complex phase in the opening, like a particle moving in a magnetic field. And um, uh, in particular, here in, in, in our proposal, we wanted to have some spatial phase for the driving such that we keep the rotational invariance. And then uh, the effect will be that we have also the, me the mecha this were the phase in the optomechanical interaction. And then we get effective phase in the mechanical hopping um, that uh, um, are a function of, of this, uh, so are this function there, but it, I still have rotational invariance. And so, uh, and uh, uh, this object, which is symmetric, and it, it, one can show that it can work as a circulator, and uh, you really have that state where uh, so the state where I go in one direction has a different energy that the one that goes in the opposite direction. And so I can have a situation where uh, I can move all in one direction. Um, and uh, yeah, and so if I build it up to an array, basically I have, uh, a, for the mechanics, I have something equivalent as uh, a system uh, with staggered, um, uh, with a staggered, uh, so this phi is the flux of the magnetic field with a staggered magnetic field. And this is well known to give uh, some topological bed structure. Uh, so as, uh, so for this, this has already pointed, uh, initially pointed out by Aldane and in particular for this Kagomi lattice in this paper from Nagawosa and, and Murakami for electronic system. Um, and uh, okay, maybe I yeah, should not go too much into the details. We have a very rich topological band structure, and we, um, and so this would be the final outcome. Um, so there is something very um, typical of optomechanics. So we consider really realistic parameters, and uh, of course, the decay rate will be uh, much larger than the band gap that we can get. But still, we have very nice uh, um, long lived uh, dynamics at the edge. And this is because basically our uh, topological excitation are most, mostly vibration. And so there will be an optical induced damping that is much smaller than the mechanical decay rate. And so we can have this very sharp feature also in the optical density of state, which is. Uh, in, in its, in, which is similar as what we discussed during the lecture when we were discussing about the um, in, in optomechanical optome induced transparency. So that uh, if I uh, uh, if I have that the optomechanical induced damping is of the same order of, uh, as the mechanical intrinsic damping, I can have suddenly a situation where uh, uh, in this bandwidth of the intrinsic and mechanical decay rate, if I shine light on a mirror, it's uh, instead of being reflected, it's all absorbed in the optomechanical system. Okay, and then, um, yeah, I wanted to mention, so this was theory, and uh, on the experimental side, there are, uh, yeah, since 2016, uh, there are many works, so these are just 
uh, two and I think some of the uh, probably the two earliest uh, that uh, explore non-reciprocity uh, in a very small system with a few uh, sides. Um, and in this way, for instance, you can be the um, you can be the a, a circulator. So a device where uh, if you inject uh, light in one port, it will go uh, uh, out to a second port. But if I inject in the second port, it will go out in the third port. Okay. Uh, and then on the uh, on the side of like multi mode system. Uh, the state of the art is, uh, or at least one one interesting experiment I want to talk about. Uh, I so from the advertisement at the beginning, I heard that you are going to hear about other uh, experiment in this, and so I'm happy that I can present this, and you will hear the other uh, next week. Um, okay, so this is our work with the Oscar Painter Group. And here we have a, a slightly different, simple approach. We want to start from an interesting mechanical band structure and just use the optomechanical interaction to inject and detect uh, mechanical excitation. Uh, so it's a word that it's on the archive. And you see, this is also like uh, an example of multi-scale optomechanical crystal. So in the optomechanical crystal that we discussed, uh, the mechanical vibration and the optical vibration have the same wavelengths. And so there is just one length scale of the feature in our pattern. Whereas here we, we follow a different approach. So there are like big holes, which have again uh, uh, the shape of a snowflake. Uh, and these mostly influence the, the mechanical properties. Uh, and then we have, uh, and so here the scale is going to be very different of what I have shown before. So the distance between snowflake before it, the distance between snowflakes was of the order of the wavelengths of light. That whereas here it's of the order of uh, like twenty microns or something like this. Uh, and then uh, on the other end we have uh, that inside of the membrane I have a photonic crystal. Where now I have really uh, that the, the, I have this much. Uh, like fine structure that basically will influence the property of, of the light. And this basically allows me to engineer a very high quality factor inside of each of these membrane. And then the idea is that I will use this high quality factor cavi optical cavity to uh, excite, uh, actually in this experiment, just to read out excitation um, in, in, that are traveling in, in, in my system. Uh, and uh, okay, as you see here now, I do not the in in this device in this particular device uh, the uh, um, so I have no optical modes that are localized in just one uh, in just one membrane, and I will be interested to couple this with like some edge state that. Uh, um, is localized on many membranes, so along the edge of of, uh, of the domain wall, and so there is not such a strong uh, mode overlap, and so the mechanical interaction will be much smaller. And that's the reason why I cannot really use the automechanical interaction to tune uh, uh, the uh, to tune the the, the mechanical uh, interactions, but I would just rather use it only to to detect my system. Uh, so it's an example of optomechanical detection. Uh, and uh, okay, for this reason, so the mechanical system, there is nothing that would break time reverse asymmetry. So I will not be able to have this uh, very robust unidirectional transport. I, I will aim for something different. Uh, and uh, yeah, we take inspiration for topological insulator. So these are also systems uh, where. Um, there are robust edge state, but uh, this and in the simplest testing, you can think of a system with the um, with the spin orbit coupling, uh, and uh, so you can have the special situation that uh, the two spins are the couple do not talk to each other, and it's like if one spin see a, a sign of the magnetic field and the other spin the opposite sign. So each Hamiltonian for it, uh, so I, I can decompose the Hamiltonian in the Hamiltonian for the two different spin direction, 
and uh, each of these uh, spin projecting Hamiltonian as shear number. And so I have edge state, but uh, I have the, the edge state for one spin moving one direction and the edge state for the other spin moving the opposite direction. So no breaking of time reversal symmetry uh, is, uh, is required. Uh, and, but there cannot be any uh, the scattering for perturbation that do not break uh, uh, the time reversal symmetry. Uh, so here, okay, maybe I have to mention that um, here the under, underlying mechanism that creates this robustness is Kramer's degeneracy, which is a property of spin one half uh, particles. So it's not so easy to, to implement in uh, in um, bosonic system, so it doesn't come naturally. Uh, and so what we do is something slightly different. Uh, so we start uh, from um, this band structure, uh, from, from, from the structure, which has C6 symmetry, as, as I mentioned before, uh, like a natural consequence of C6 symmetry. If you have many bands, you will have Dirac cons. So here we have a continuous structure. We have uh, as many bands as we want, and we have engineered the parameter of our system in such a way that we have bands uh, with the Dirac cons, which is very well isolated. Um, and then uh, the next step uh, is, uh, and this is what is called valley all effect, is you break the C six symmetry, and so these the cones are protected by the C six symmetry, and this uh, then will. Uh, uh, create a band gap. Uh, and this is the band gap that we want to use to, to have edge state. Uh, in particular, here we break, you see this mirror symmetry. Yeah. And, um, and then, um, so the connection to, to the churn number is that if I focus now only on the excitation in one valley close to one of the uh, okay, you know, the, if I have a triangular lattice, the brilliant zone has the form of an hexagon, and for graphene, the Dirac cones are at, in, this, in the I symmetry point, K and K prime. And again, this is a general property that comes from the symmetry. Now I, I break the symmetry, and this cone becomes gapped. Uh, and then I can look at uh, the churn number close. Normally, the churn number is an integral over the whole brilliant zone. And if I have these deep Dirac cones, the, the, uh, the quantity that I'm integrating, which is called very curvature, will be strongly peaked about these Dirac cones. And so I can define uh, about the valley. I can define uh, basically a charm number for the valley. And uh, I will, since overall I didn't break the time reversal symmetry uh, in the two uh, Basically, the, the, the churn number in the two value will cancel out to give globally churn number zero. Uh, but if I focus only on one value, I have a finite churn number, which is alpha integer. Uh, and then uh, the way how people engineer uh, uh, state that are fairly robust is uh, to uh, basically create a domain wall uh, where in, if I focus on just one value, I have opposite sign of the churn number in the, in the two domains. And so, uh, and in this situation, the bulk boundary correspondence tell me that I will have one edge state. And indeed, uh, if I, uh, that's the case. So this is something that comes out from a large point blank description in terms of the Dirac equation. So it's something that I can really mathematically prove and I, and I can see in uh, also in finite element simulations. Okay. And uh, uh, and so the idea is that here the valley plays the role of the spin. In one valley, I have an edge state that go uh, to the right, and in the other valley, I have an edge state that goes to the left. This is what is the value of effect is about? Uh, and this will be robust because if I have a sharp corner, uh, so this is you see this is what is special about the Dirac cons. I can really change direction of propagation without changing very much the momentum. And so here I cooked up a situation where I can really make very sharp turn if I go in one direction, but to change direction I have to, without changing too much the momentum. But if I want uh, to change direction, I really have to switch to the other valley. And this is uh, large momentum transfer is difficult. And so this process is suppressed. Uh, okay, and so this we have uh, verified experimentally. Uh, so our setup uh, is very 
simple. So we have like a taper fiber and which we can uh, basically detect the thermal vibration at uh, any uh, of these. Um, uh, so we have cavity in each membrane and, and at any of these very tiny on this cave membrane, we can uh, measure the excitation with the movable. Uh, optical fiber. And this is what we see if we measure in uh, just one uh, on just one side, so a series of peaks. So, and then I will make the, the claim that uh, this spectrum uh, show me that uh, um, already show me it's a big indication that there is no best scattering. And uh, afterwards, I will give you also more strong evidence. But if you you could already see it from this, and the reason, so basically in this case, the footprint of um, uh, basically transport without uh, without the scattering is that all these resonances are equally spaced. If I would have uh, a situation where um, uh, where I have best scattering, I would have rather like doublets. Uh, um, because basically the idea is that these are, uh, uh, if I don't have the scattering, I have I like perfectly degenerate. So, I, okay. Uh, maybe I have to think this explanation through more, but okay, if I have, um, if I have, um, um, uh, if I have the uh, scattering, I would have two, uh, basically, uh, two uh, frequency scales. So one would be like the um, the the separation, uh, the the free spectral range for just one. Uh, if I'm thinking about the modes that move only in just one direction, uh, but then there will be also splitting because I have a smaller splitting because I have more more that op more move in the opposite direction. Okay, maybe that was too complicated, sorry. Uh, but uh, so this is more evidence, and I think this is more convincing. Um, so basically, what we see here is uh, what is the uh, spectrum as a function of the size. So now I'm measuring it, I, I'm doing some positional soft measurement. Uh, and um, you can see that there is no best scattering because there is no interference. So if you would have best scattering, uh, uh, you would uh, have that, that uh, some part of the wave would be uh, reflected, and then you would start to have some interference pattern. So for instance, this is a last sim simulation if I would have 10% best scattering, so that would be a huge. Um, okay, we did some more quant quantitative analysis, uh, maybe this is um, just a bit of it. Uh, and uh, okay, with this, I guess I finished my material. <laughs> uh, and um, are there any question? I don't see any at the moment, but uh, this was a lot of very exciting material. So maybe people just need to digest a bit. Um, so for that, I think it will also be useful because Vittorio offered to share his lectures with us, uh, his lecture slides with us. So then people can maybe have a closer look at what you showed. Um, yeah, maybe um, maybe I can ask a quick question going back to your um, traveling wave amplifier that you showed. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe? Briefly explain again, you, you showed that you engineer the, the phases in the coupling constant. Could you maybe quickly comment on how you would get these phases in practice, you know, in the G's, in the GI? Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't really talk. Ah, OK. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you're talking about the automechanical. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so this is not yet an amplifier. So the, the amplifier, I didn't talk about it today. Um, just the, the system, basically. Um, yeah, yeah. And for the amplifier, we didn't have in mind necessarily an automechanical system. But yes, you are referring to this. Yes. Uh, yeah. So here, the idea is that uh, the, impor the important ingredient is that you are driving all the sides coherently, so with the same laser. 
but the waist front of this laser uh, has uh, like a pattern of phases. So the different sides should be uh, driven at different phases. And uh, the choice that is most, most convenient, convenient is um, this one so that uh, uh, I have in, I will have translation invariance, so I can focus on the unit cell and the phase always increase by two pi divided by three when I go about the unit cell. And this, this is a good choice because it uh, keeps the rotational invariance, uh, which is uh, quite important because if I break spatial symmetry, I can open a trigger then gap. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and then the idea is that I consider a regime um, where, um, um, okay, in overall, so I mean, this assumption here, I'm just explaining it in the simple regime, which is not very realistic, but uh, uh, the main ingredient is the breaking of the time reversal asymmetry. So it will work also if I relax very much this assumption. But what I was assuming here is that, and this is the unrealistic part, that the optical uh, coupling between the different sides. So this is typically a very large coupling because I'm in the terahertz. And so this will be definitely much larger than G uh, and, um, and the tuning. Uh, but, uh, and in fact, so in our simulation and in more complicated explanation, we, we consider a more general regime where this J is very large as it should be. But if you want to explain uh, what happens in, in the simplest term, you can pretend that this is small. And then uh, what happens if the mechanics is the tune from the optics, you can think of virtual coherent processes. And then uh, if you treat uh, the interaction as a perturbation and the, also the optical opening as a perturbation, uh, you get an effective, uh, um, an effective uh, uh, mechanical opening rate that, that uh, is, uh, complex and this complex from comes from the interference of the intrinsic opting and the optical induced opting. Well, uh, this is a very non-trivial dependence on the phases of the G's probably, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. So you have this product of this phase. So this is e to the i to pi three, but I'm summing with some real thing and so, then the phase will be something in between zero and e to the i to pi divided by three, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the phase, the phases that you engineer for the optics and the um, mechanics can be quite different, right? For the two. I know. So for the mechanics, there's no phase. So all the phase comes from the. That was something. Ah, okay. So basically, yeah, I'm in a regime where uh, I will have a strong back action of the optics on the mechanics. For mm -hmm. the optics, it will not matter very much uh, what I'm uh, doing because, yeah, I'm assuming basically that this Kij, which is much more than Jij. And so if I, I mean, this is really actually, it will be true in general. So since this uh, mechanical frequency are typically much more than, than the optical frequency, uh, in principle, there is also a mechanical induced uh, Opping for the for the optics, but this would be like complete small perturbation. Whereas for the mechanics, I can know that the optical induced opping is of the order of the mechanical induced opping. So this is the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this makes makes sense. So mm -hmm. the optics hardly feel the mechanics, the the phases from the coming from. Yeah. The and so an interesting thing that I didn't explain is that. Um, so if you adjust the optical opening uh, or just the mechanical opening, there is no complex phase. Uh, it's just the superposition of the two that give them, or uh, also very interesting, I can get it if I don't have any mechanical opening, but, but I have both uh, the beam splitting and the uh, tumor squeezing interaction. Then I can have the interference between the beam splitting and tumor squeezing interaction can also Create these complex phases. That's very interesting. Mm. Well, um, I think this is a good time to uh, wrap it up. Thank you, Vittorio. It was really okay, thank you very much. 
That's very enjoy. I, I enjoyed it a lot and I learned a lot. Um, and I've also seen a lot of thank you uh, messages in the chat. So I think. Um, yeah. No, thank you all very much for listening. I was, uh, I had a feeling it was at times <laughs> a little bit chaotic because I, yeah, I uh, prepared in, in a quite a spontaneous way, but it was fun. Yeah, I think we, I, I enjoyed a lot um, the intuitive explanations that you gave. Um, and I think, at least for me, this was very useful. Okay, um, yeah, that's good to hear. So, um, if you, if the listeners, in the, it would help us a lot if also the people who attended would give some feedback. So, I put a link in the chat that uh, to a Google form. Um, it would be really great if you could uh, fill that in and provide some feedback to Vittorio, but also let us know um, what you would like to hear about uh, next, what, what topics you'd like to hear in future lectures, for example. It shouldn't take long, it's just three questions, but it would help us a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, if you would like to hear more about the um, field of topological for, uh, optomechanics, as I advertised in the beginning, we will have a block on this starting uh, in a little bit less than two weeks. Um, so you'll hear more about this then. But uh, for now, let's just thank Vittorio again for this amazing lecture series. Um, and we'll send out this, uh, the slides soon as well, if Vittorio is fine with this. Yeah, sure, of course. And yeah, with, with, that, with that, let's wrap it up. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we hope to see you uh, in two weeks with our next blog. OK, bye-bye. Bye.